Chapter 23 Buried Alive We set out to meet Juggalos face to clowny face once again on yet another massive in-store tour. Billy Bill, the same Billy Bill who stuck with us from day one from way back in 90 on through thick and thin since he first took the job at Psychopathic for a mere 50 bucks a week and sometimes went months without pay was becoming a well-known touring manager. And now, as all of you know, Billy Bill is actually the current CEO of Psychopathic Records. More about that at a later time. But right now, Billy was fast climbing the ranks in the touring industry as a well-known, hard-working, professional tour manager. Not a name to the record-buying public, but in fact, a star inside the industry. Other bands and agencies were, and still are, steady trying to hire Billy to help them run their tours. Billy always stays with us, though, of course. From club to stadium to arena, Billy is known for his organization, hard work, and dedication to the job. In other words, just like many of the people at Psychopathic Records, Billy Bill fucking schools the shit out of his job. The funny part is, nobody ever really showed him the ropes. He just picked it all up on his own, learning along the way, from the bottom to the top. He straight up mastered the art of touring all around. Road management, stage management, stage lighting, PA and sound, crew, buses, hotels, tour routing, unionized venues, and all that good shit. Billy knows his shit inside and out. When we first hired Billy, he was just like us. Fresh off the Detroit streets without a clue in hell of how to do anything in this business at all. And look at him now. Today, CEO of Psychopathic Records. Wow. If people say, man, ICP sure has come a long way. I hope they mean ICP as in the whole family and not just Joey and I. Without the help of ninjas like Billy, Rob, and Alex, ICP would still be plucking hood emblems right now. Even though it's mad out of style, we'd still be doing it. Because we'd probably be crackheads and wouldn't know any better. We're proud as fuck to have Billy running our shit. Even when we tour just to sign autographs with Billy around, we always know the shit is going to be done the best way possible. This time for our autograph tour, we had a professional company from L.A. design and make us an actual small haunted house that we called the Asylum. It was a little dark, ruthless maze actually constructed inside the record stores. Remember those big, huge record stores like Coconuts, FYE, and all those fresh stores that used to exist? Remember them? The real big ones at the mall? Just chock full of rare CDs, hard to find CDs, and fresh albums, vinyl, and DVDs, and VHS tapes? Well, they're all gone. But back then, they were were in effect and we were in effect with the asylum in-store tour just so juggalos could go through it and have a little bit more fun before getting a stale ass autograph the juggalos five at a time would walk in and on one side they'd see eight boy in a small cage trying to get at them then they'd turn around in another corner and there they would see twisted locked up behind some thick glass they could talk to them and shit but they couldn't sign anything because they were trapped behind the glass Hannibal Lecter style misery was also supposed to be there but we had a slight falling out with him and he was temporarily off psychopathic records back then we used to have fallouts all the time with our two artists twisted in misery all of which would last three or four days before they were back we kept twisted behind the glass for two reasons number one 
it helped give them a name and hype up our upcoming amazing Jekyll Brothers tour. Juggalos were all like, wow man, I can't wait to see those guys behind the glass get on stage. I'll bet they're crazy as fuck. Remember at this point, Twisted as a group was still relatively, majorly unknown. And number two, it looked cool as fuck with both groups together in one crazy dark mini psycho ward. When the Juggalos walked around the last corner of the asylum, there would be Joey and I sitting at a table under the big black lights ready to sign their shit up. It was awesome. We even had our entire crew dressed up all in white mental ward uniforms. Get this. As the 600 or so Juggalos waited outside for us to show up, we would pull up in a white mental ward van with bars on the windows and four doctor guards driving us. We'd all get out, chained up together, chain gang style, and the Juggalos fucking loved it as the doctors dragged us, fighting and pulling and trying to get away as they dragged us in our motherfucking straight jackets into the record store. All wild and chaotic. It was so much fun. That's a fresh way to do it in store instead of just sitting your ass behind a table like, what's your name, son? We did it with style and class. So there we were, doing in-store after in-store. The best thing about the Asylum in-store booth was that we could actually fuck hoes right there on the floor in the middle of the record store, and nobody would even know what was happening in there. We pulled that off countless times, especially me. Being a minute man made it extra easy as hell for me. Plus, I always had an excuse for why I was so quick. The girls would be like, what happened? And I'd be like, I'm done. We have to be quick, remember? We're doing an in-store. That was my excuse, but in reality, I gave them everything I had for as long as I could. One day, all was well when suddenly the line stopped and in came Alex, what career-threatening bullshit was he going to lay down on us this time? We've been offered $100,000 to play Woodstock, Alex said. A hundred grand? What? That's all I needed to hear. I was down. I figured we'd do the show naked with dildos hanging out of Shaggy's ass for that kind of loot. Where do we sign, I asked. Some juggalos might have looked at us playing Woodstock 99 as a selloutish kind of move on our part. Hey, the way I look at it, Woodstock 99 sold out by asking us to play. They sold out the mainstream style for us. Woodstock never came to us and asked us to change one fucking thing about our show. They wanted ICP just as ICP comes and nothing else. If that ain't fresh, then I don't know what the fuck is. All we at ICP and Psychopathic ever do is cry about how the fucking world in the fucking industry ignores us and never gives us any props for all we've done. Well, here you have the promoters of motherfucking Woodstock 99 actually inviting our crazy clown asses to play at Woodstock. It's hard to believe. And there we were, booked to perform with the biggest artists in the world in 1999. I'm talking about Limp Biscuit. They were on top of the fucking world. Kid Rock, Corn. All of them, they were all part of Woodstock 99, and there had to be at least 150,000 people there. It was sheer madness. madness. So here they are, Woodstock, actually considering ICP as such a major force in today's music world that they invited us to come along and do our thing along with all the other greats at that time. What the fuck is wrong with that? Most people don't know this, but many bands and the press alike diss the fuck out of Woodstock and its promoters for asking Insane Clown Posse to play. That's no lie. Woodstock straight up caught hell for inviting us. We heard that crybaby Moby was almost going to pull off the fucking gig when he heard ICP was part of it. He said it cheapened the whole event. Moby. Well, where the fuck is Moby right now? Fuck a Moby. 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 Who the fuck would call themselves Moby? Motherfucker Moby? 
If you ask me, I fucking love the people behind Woodstock for asking ICP to play their event and then standing behind us the whole time. We'll love them forever for that. They helped us make a dream come true by asking us along. I just know that there had to be a juggalo somewhere behind all of that. So anyone out there dissing, you need to figure out what's better. Crying about being ignored all the time or celebrating when props finally do come our way. Now, for Woodstock, we wanted to make a big statement. As far as we were concerned, this was our first show where we were actually being recognized as a part of America's main music culture. So we wanted to be as all out as possible. I made our entire crew, from the sound men to the security guards, down to the fucking stagehands with us, all dress exactly the same. They all wore white, old school Fila shoes, black jeans, black psychopathic records baseball jerseys, black fingerless gloves, and black psychopathic hats. We all looked ruthless and tight as fuck. The whole crew, all three of our tour buses, were decaled up, fully wrapped with flames, and our ICP name and logo, and everything as we rolled onto the scene. I have to be honest though, I never really knew how big Woodstock was. At the time, I just looked at it like it was another big ass festival of some sort. But when we were still like 500 miles away, we realized what a big deal this shit really was. We saw all these cars on the freeway. They had Woodstock bound signs in their back windows and shit. It was truly fucking epic. We arrived that morning to see hundreds of thousands of people camped out amid piles and mountains of trash. It was fucking awesome. It looked like Mad Max. We pulled our loud and proud painted up tour buses right in that bitch like, look who's here, motherfuckers. I'll never forget it. Driving those tour buses right across the grass, rolling right through the campground at Woodstock in a convoy. Fucking three buses and two semi-trucks all riding through like a train. Each one of them fully decaled up with ICP as big as hell, full color on the sides, marching right through the masses of Woodstock. Truly, it was one of our proudest, most awesome moments. I remember the people banging on the bus. You could hear... <laughs> The buses were rocking as we cruised over the hills and rode through that enormous 100,000 people filled campsite. Wow, was that dope. And just seeing the rows and rows of buses already there, we realized Woodstock is like the World Series of Bands. Only the elite were invited. No bands played Woodstock that you never heard of. Every band was there to represent what they did. Everybody had an hour to do their thing, to show off their goods in front of the human ocean. We were there to represent what the fuck we did. We had brought our full stage, full costumes, and full props. And of course, we brought full-on Fago. We got painted up, and right away we started to check out the scene backstage. We don't hardly do radio-style festivals like everybody else. It was crazy seeing all the other groups just chilling backstage. There was good old George Clinton with Bootsy Collins just chilling. Wow, there were the guys from Lit, who I don't even remember anymore. The ninjas from Offspring walked by me, and the main guy kind of mean mugged us. He's lucky I didn't show him how fly this white guy is by knocking the chin off his face. Then we seen my old homie, the one guy who used to be the DJ from Onyx. He was now DJing for DMX, which was awesome. He was the one guy, the only guy who was cool to us way back in the day when we were opening up for Onyx on that crazy tour where we got booed off every night. Their DJ was always surprising us and being cool as hell, remembering our names and being kind to us. And once again, here's Woodstock, and he remembered us again by name and everything. He even told us he keeps an eye on us all the time just to see what we're up to. That guy was cool as hell. I just wish I knew his fucking name. Anyway, 
I was riding around backstage on this motorized scooter thing near this thing called the press wall, and as soon as I rode around the corner, strobe light style cameras started going off. Just massive media everywhere, all posted up behind this gate. I'm talking major press from all over the world, all snapping and flashing and screaming photos at us. What? I stopped and did a few of my favorite Hulk Hogan poses, and Shaggy did a moonwalker too, and his normal fuck the press stances. Believe it or not, we later went back up to the press wall because Island had some shit all set up for us to do. Interview after interview, every reporter we talked to, we were like, fuck you, we're doing this for the money. We just didn't care what they printed because we knew that the reporters are all mostly assholes and they'll twist and turn your words into whatever the fuck they're trying to get you to sound like anyway. So after we did our daily exercise of making ICP's name worse off than it already was, we got back on our scooters. That's when I noticed Cheryl Crow standing with a bunch of people. There she was. Cheryl Crow. She had on some tight black leather pants on and the sun was shining off them, making her butt all shiny and black leathery straight up tempting me. She didn't have a very big butt, I'm not gonna lie. In fact, her ass looked more like an old lady's whiskey ass. In that sunlight though, and the fact that that sandbag ass of hers was connected to Cheryl Crow made it all very, very tempting. It was extremely tempting. I stopped for a second and I thought long and hard about it. Now's my chance. All I gotta do is brave up for the next 20 seconds and do something stupid, but I'll have a lifelong story, not to mention a bomb ass memory for the rest of my life. So I backed my motorized scooter up and I hit the little electric pedal and rode right into Cheryl Crow's ass piece. <laughs> That's right. Not one, but both my hands groped her fucking leather-coated, somewhat hot, flabby whiskey ass. Of course, she got super pissed, and so did the ninja she was with. I played it off all too well, though. Having just filmed the movie, I was somewhat of an expertise actor, so I acted like I was falling off my out-of-control scooter and like I had to reach for something, anything to break my fall. That something or anything just happened to be her sweaty butt cheeks. Now, you'd think that her butt would have been somewhat toned and defined from standing on stage and playing guitar and dancing around for every day of her life. But no, it was actually rather flabby and loose, kind of like a fat kid's jelly stomach. I was slightly upset at the tone of Cheryl Crow's ass. I wanted a firm, perky, tight ass, but instead it felt more like a fucking half-filled water balloon. The super hot Cheryl Crow actually had a super flabby, loopy, jello type ass. My fingers actually sunk into the cheeks of her butt. Her ass was more like a pair of leather pants full of warm milk than an ass. I wanted to dry off my hands afterwards, only they weren't wet. <laughs> now, not too many people can say they goose Cheryl Crow's ass, can they? I mean, I, I think Kid Rock can say it, but so can I. The only difference is Kid Rock goosed her ass when he was fucking her. I goosed her ass like a weird fucking pervert falling off my scooter trying to cop a feel. But besides all that, I still got to goose her ass. I mean, really think about it. Like I'd say, if I don't know any better, less than maybe a hundred people on this earth have goose Cheryl Crow's ass. Maybe a little more. Maybe like 150. She's kind of old. Maybe 200. I don't know if she's married. Maybe she's a freak. Let's say 250 people have goosed her ass on this earth in her life, okay? Well, she was a backup singer for Michael Jackson, so let's bump it up to about 300. Not that Michael did any ass grabbing, but I'm sure his road crew might have. Since she's been famous though, I'll bet less than 10 people have goosed Cheryl Crow's ass. I know she don't stage dive, so you can't count them grabs. At Woodstock, I goosed her fucking fat jelly old ass. Me, Joe Bruce, chalk up another one for the scrubs, baby. Cause my fingers were knuckle deep in them ass cheeks. Yeah! And I know what you're thinking, motherfucker. 
You're probably thinking, so who the fuck is Cheryl Crow? First of all, when I goosed her fucking ass with my fingers, she was fucking on top of the world famous, all right? Number two, who the fuck's ass if you goosed, motherfucker? All right? I goosed Cheryl Crow's ass with both my fucking hands, all right? While she was on top of the world. Anyway, I won't brag about it anymore. I'll just continue. When it came time for us to perform, we found out that corn was going on halfway through our set on the other stage. You see, there were two giant stages on opposite ends of the park. One, corn was going to be playing halfway through our set. So frankly, I thought nobody was going to be there to see us because of that. And plus, we were actually playing on what I considered to be the scrubbier stage because the other stage had all the really, really big acts on it. We got in the shuttle to take us the half mile or so over to our stage, and pretty soon we could actually hear a crowd chanting, ICP, thousands and thousands of people, as far as the human eye can see, ICP, ICP. They weren't all corn fans, I guess, because there were thousands of juggalos, I'm talking thousands of juggalos and thousands of curious ninjas too and we gave them all the best we could i told my stage crew i'll give you guys two thousand bucks each if you run across the stage butthole naked they were like what and i was like i just want madness and chaos during our show come on we all gotta fucking do something crazy you guys get naked they were like we're down to do something crazy but why do we gotta get naked just get naked, because naked means craziness. So get naked. They're like, why don't you get naked? And I was like, hey, fuck you. I don't get naked unless it's for a hot chick in the dark. You get naked, and you get $2,000 for doing it. Now strip. So two of our homies, Tom Dub and Psycho Patrick, both decided to do it and take the money. Next thing you know, nutsacks were flapping and wangs were waggling because they were both butthole ass naked on stage with nothing on but clown masks. Wow, it was the shit. Then we had mad naked bitches up on stage. None of them we had to pay. They were naked on their own. Crazy naked bitches. I think we had more naked bitches at our show than any other band there. At least I hope. The stage was so huge. It was like half a football field. I was way winded from running across it. Kicking Fagos trying to reach the crowd was almost fucking impossible because the crowd was so far back from the stage. There were these rigs and cameras set up on tracks between you and the audience, which sucked. It was a big professional show, but it wasn't what we were used to. We're used to being so fucking close to the front row, we can headbutt those ninjas if we want. To really get some heat, we kicked these huge beach balls into the crowd with hundreds of dollars taped to them, and people were just going nuts after them. I'd say to the crowd, throw your hands in the air, and you could see the sound traveling through the crowd as the arms raised from front to the back of the crowd like a huge wave. It was so fucking amazing. Do you fathom what I'm saying to you? We would say, throw your hands in the air. And first the front row would do it, and as the sound traveled back, you would see the crowd doing it, raising their arms in the air as they hear the request. It was fucking nuts. It was an ocean of human beings. The biggest crowd we've ever performed in front of to this day. And it was fresh with those beach balls. Because first we had slightly bigger than regular size beach balls. And we said, hey, there's a hundred dollar bill taped to each one of these beach balls. And we kicked like ten of them out into the crowd. And everybody was jumping up trying to grab the beach balls. And that was just making them bounce higher into the sky. Then we rolled out these huge fucking beach balls about as tall as us. And we said, there's $500 taped to these, and there was, and we booted the huge beach balls out into the crowd. So here above the crowd were all these beach balls flying around, and ninjas trying to grab the money off them as hard as they could. It was crazy, and we just wanted an insane, memorable, sporadic, lunatic show, and we had naked nutsacks bouncing around, 
titty nipples flailing around and pointing and shooting lasers, beach balls full of bank, bouncing around, fucking fagel two liters soaring through the sky, all kinds of freshness and fanatical madness happening, and we went on during the daytime, but it didn't matter, we still tore the fucking house down! However, a few things did suck though. First of all, the pay-per-view crowd must have really hated our set because they had a technical problem, of course, and it made our sound fucking terrible. The second thing I didn't like about the show was how far back the juggalos were from the stage. Like I said, it was hard to connect with the crowd because they were so fucking far back. Other than that, it truly was amazing. But if you do watch the DVD for Woodstock 99, you'll see us performing the song Fuck the World. And unfortunately, it's all technically fucked up. The track is different than the track we're hearing on the stage. So it's sort of like we wrapped the entire thing off beat. And it's not off beat. It just comes across that way. The way the technical difficulties fucked everything up for our set. So that was a bummer. At least the live audience didn't get the bone. And they received it the way it was supposed to be. Only the DVD and the pay-per-view audience got the bone. My bad. That night... I fucked this chick, Woodstock style. Peace and love, I got a piece of that ass and I loved it. I'm out. We knew Woodstock was a giant break for us, so we naturally wanted to share the hookup with our brothers in paint. We had actually originally asked Twisted to come out and do the second half of our set with us. That was our tactic back then, remember? Whatever breaks ICP got, Twisted got as well. Anything, 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 even Woodstock, we wanted to share our set with Twisted to get them all that exposure on Woodstock. After all, just like us, Twisted, of course, wasn't getting any kind of radio play or video support, so we always had to have their backs any way we could, Woodstock included. But much to our surprise, Jamie and Paul hated the idea. Amazing! Passing up on Woodstock? What? what? No matter how hard we tried to talk them into doing it, they just wouldn't. In fact, the whole Woodstock issue sparked a three-week-long argument between us and them. Our arguments never lasted more than days, like I said. But this one lasted slightly longer, because we were pissed. We wanted them on that stage. We wanted that exposure for them. But they didn't want it. And it felt like they were working against the goal we were trying to get to. After all, they are really like family to Joey and I. And no show, no matter how big, could ever fuck that up for us. So we got over it. And we continue to move on as a family to this day. But damn, I still think it would have been fresher if Twisted would have graced that stage too. It just would have been dope for the Juggalos. For the amazing Jekyll Brothers tour, we recruited some of the dopest names we could get. We had Biohazard, Crazy Bone from Bone Thugs and Harmony, Twisted of course, and the crazy ass band called Mindless Self Indulgence. And for just the beginning of the tour, we had Cold Chamber. This one band Sharon Osborne, Ozzy Osborne's wife, managed. Biohazard was the shit on that tour. It was crazy, but Juggalos loved them. Evan and his boys were one of the only bands out there who actually impressed the Juggalos with their hardest of hardcore music flavor. Mind the self-indulgence? They were some crazy-ass ninjas who I was positive would have blew up large as hell one day, but it's yet to happen. Their shit was so super tight, and I still bump it to this day. The funny thing about having them on the tour was always trying to fuck the two chicks in their band. If I would have actually done it, I would tell y'all, but I never could actually pull it off. They had boyfriends and shit, I guess. So stale. But as for Crazy Bone, what the fuck can I say? Bone Thugs and Harmony is one of our all-time favorite rap groups on the planet. Any group that can actually create and authenticate their own original rap flow, not inspired by anybody 
other than the gods above. They created their own flow, and hundreds of groups have ripped it off ever since. But I bow to Bone Thugs and Harmony for pulling it off, and I'm forever one of their biggest fans. So having Crazy Bone open up this tour was ultra elite. When Crazy was out with us on the amazing Jekyll Brothers tour, Joey and I fucking stood backstage and sang along with every lyric every night. One night at an outdoor show in St. Louis, we got so fucking excited and geeked that we couldn't take it anymore. We grabbed the spare mics and just straight up ran out on stage with them for Bone Thugs and Harmony's rendition of Fuck the Police. That was one of my favorite moments ever on stage. Just sharing the stage with Crazy Bone and doing an NWA cover was something I'll never forget. I wonder if anybody's actually still listening to my fucking endless babbling at this point. Are you listening? Is anybody out there actually hearing this? I'm so far into this audiobook. You've been listening for fucking weeks by now. Are you still listening? Do you still hear me? Do you hear me? Let me tell you something I've never told anybody. Just for you, for listening, I'm going to skip out of the story and tell you something that was never in the book, something nobody knows. This is for you, because you're actually still listening. One time, I was laying down in a park, just relaxing, but apparently, I was laying on some poison ivy. And, naturally, later that day, I itched my nuts, like all men do. All men itched their balls, but I had poison ivy on my fingers. And soon, I had poison ivy on my balls. And then my balls were infected with poison ivy. Next thing you know, two days goes by, and I'm with this chick, and we're in the hotel room, and I come out of the shower. Next thing you know, she goes to top me off. Everything's awesome, except suddenly she goes, Ew! What's on your dick? Fuck this, I'm gone! Oh God, there's something all over your dick! It was one of the most horrifying, embarrassing moments of my life. I had to try to explain to her it was poison ivy and not some fucking STD, but she wasn't buying it. She left in a fucking hump of tears and ran home. Oh, it was so horrible. I hope somebody's still listening because I just shared an intimate, embarrassing story. All right, back to the story. The only band that didn't belong on the Amazing Jekyll Brothers tour was... Coal Chamber. There were three reasons why I knew these dudes wouldn't last long on our tour. Number one, they wore fishnet thong bikini underwear underneath their leather mini skirts, both on and off stage, and we hated that. They also wore their shit so tight you could just about see their dicks protruding through the holes in their fishnets. Not that I noticed that or anything. That's what you guys like to wear then. Eh, shoot for it. The second reason. The one hot chick that was in the band wasn't there because she was off having a baby. And they replaced her with some seven foot tall man woman Amazon beast thing. It was a bitch too. It never even once said hi or anything to us. Even when I walked up to say hi and welcome them to the tour, it just sat there, raised its foot for me to shake hands with. What the fuck? And the third reason, and the biggest reason, is this. One thing was missing on their end. Fans. Cold Chamber wasn't worth any of the bullshit trouble they were. Every night, there'd only be three or four kids in the audience wearing the whole fishnet g-string look of theirs. You always knew the one or two Cold Chamber fans in the crowd because they were the ones with the nipples cut out of their shirts. Nobody was coming to see them at our shows. We were paying them a whopping seven grand a night to be there and we had hoped that they would be able to sell some fucking tickets. Maybe we could even make some new fans by all the people coming to see Cold Chamber. But they didn't even sell any merchandise. They only sold three butt plugs, two nipple clamps, and maybe a cock ring or two every night. And that's about it. Rob and I made the business decision. After the third show, we asked them to come down on their pay. But Cold Chamber refused. They said, 
Do you see how tight these fucking leather pants are? Don't you see my dick outlined? The chicks fucking love this shit. Look at my fishnet thong. I've been wearing this for three tours. Do you know how nasty this fucking thong is? But I still wear it because they love it. The fans love it. And we were like, what fans, motherfucker? There's no fans out there to see you. Those are all juggalos. Still, they refused to come down in their pay. So, plain and simple, we told them to kick rocks and booted them off the fucking tour. That's right. Three shows in, we kicked them right the fuck off the Amazing Jekyll Brothers tour. Now, to keep it honest, a grand total of about 12 tickets were returned for the rest of the entire tour. Which means we would have been paying Cold Chamber seven grand a night to draw 12 people. And because we kicked Cold Chamber off the tour, those 12 people refunded their tickets. Wow. So, I'm not saying they can't sell any tickets. I know Cold Chamber back then was worth a lot of tickets, in fact. They were a pretty big band, and I know they have thousands of their own fans. It's just that Cold Chamber's fans, a.k.a. the Fudgelos, are afraid of Juggalos, I guess. And if you're wondering about the word Fudgelo, I'm assuming it means Fudge Packers, yo. And I'll just leave it at that. You can speculate if you wish. I'll even give you some speculation music. You see, it's a music industry no-no to throw one of Sharon Osbourne's bands off your tour. That's what we'd always heard. We've always heard about how dangerous, ruthless, and powerful Sharon Osbourne is. We actually thought it would be a benefit to have Cold Chamber on our tour because Sharon Osbourne would be helping to promote it and the tour would be bigger. But in fact, Cold Chamber was like lugging around a car with no wheels, just dragging along a big clunk of shit with your tour worth nothing. So we told Cold Chamber to fuck off despite the fearful Sharon Osbourne as their manager. You see, she may be a giant in the music industry, but we're not part of the music industry. The fact is, we're in the streets. That's the only industry we're a part of. The underground and Sharon Osbourne don't know shit about the underground. We told Cold Chamber, kick rocks and go to fuck home and fuck themselves while they're fucking at it. And we didn't give a fucking fuck to think nothing about it, motherfuckers. Besides, who the fuck is Sharon Osbourne? What could she do to us? So what if she's a giant in the music business? What bridges are we burning by pissing her off? First of all, we would have to be using some of those bridges to begin with, right? Well, from day one, ICP has only built and used our own bridges. So, fuck her. Change the subject for a second. Howard Stern. Now, both before he was with Sirius and now that he's with Sirius, we've been on the show for a grand total of something like 20 times. Because I guess he thinks the shit that happens to us is pretty funny. Howard Stern is definitely cool as fuck. We love that ninja. I can tell Robin hates us though, and that sucks. She always says that she saw me at the Virgin Records mega store in New York, which no longer exists, and that she said hi to me, but I just kept walking away from her because I was fronting like it wasn't me. Now, I don't know what the fuck Robin is talking about, but she's been telling me this for years. The truth is, I don't ever remember bumping into her at the Virgin Megastore in New York City. That ain't true at all. The truth is, if I saw Robin anywhere, I'd be all over her nuts. I love Robin. I think she's cool as fuck. And as for seeing her at the store and me playing her to the curb, I don't know what the hell she's talking about. 
I wish I had more time to watch the show more often so I knew who all the mother ninjas are. I know there's Howard, Robin, Gary, and that's about all I know. The rest of them ninjas I'm clueless about. Even when we do the show live on the air, I always hear them other guys laughing and saying shit here and there from different microphones, but I have no idea where they are or even who they are. It's fun as fuck for Joey and I to do the Howard Stern Show, of course. Here, I'll explain how the event goes almost every time. This is how it usually goes when we do the show. First off, we always gotta wake up before the fucking owls have even called it at night. Believe me, for our whole lives, waking up early has always been one of the hardest things possible for us to do. Then we gotta get painted up and head right down to the station. As the limo turns left, right, left, and right again, speeding up and stopping through the busy Manhattan streets, we always come close to throwing up. It's hard for us to even drive in a car because of that stale morning sickness we always get from waking up so fucking early. We slowly climb out of the limo, stretch, and walk into the building. There we meet up with a security guard who calls up ahead to clear us, and then we take the elevator all the way up. As soon as we step off the elevator, here comes the ninja with the camera, right up on you, right up in your face, filming everything you're saying and doing as you walk your way to the green room. The hardest part about this is trying to be funny and shit at 7 in the fucking morning or whatever. And that camera kid has no mercy either. He slaps that fucking lens all up in your fucking grill while you're yawning and shit. And them ninjas must wake up at like 3 a.m. or something. Because by the time we get there, they are fucking wide awake. Maybe, just maybe, cocaine plays a role in that. I don't know. Once again, speculation. And then, once he's got enough stale footage of you yawning and laying around the green room half asleep trying to make stale jokes, he finally turns his camera off and walks away. After a half hour or so, in comes Gary. He's cool. He always welcomes us to the show and leads us right in. Boom! The second we walk in the studio, we're already on the air. Which is okay, because we really don't change up our personalities that much on or off the air. And neither does Howard. Even during commercial breaks, he's the same guy. I just wish it wasn't always so fucking early when we do this show. The first couple times we did the Howard Stern Show, we would always have a representative from Island Records there with us. But after about the fourth time doing it, Island finally quit sending them down there with us. All we did was diss the fuck out of Island anyway when we were on the air every time. We have always hated whatever record label we're on. When you really look at it, I think the reason for that is a simple one. All record labels fucking suck dick holes. That's why. I remember one of the earlier times when we did the show, an island representative was down there at the Howard Stern show with us. We were all waiting in the green room, and I asked him if anybody at Island Records actually listens to ICP. He said, no, but so what? I mean, you guys sell units, and that's all that matters. I could try to sound tough in this book, but I have to be honest, that shit really sucked when that asshole said that. I knew at least he was telling the truth. Fuck record companies, all of them. It's too bad we need them to reach y'all. Everybody always asks us what Howard Stern is like away from the show, and I always have the same answer. I wish I knew. We always invite him out to our New York area shows and to the gathering, but he never ever shows up. Probably because he's got to be in bed by 6 p.m. in order to wake up fresh and rested early at 2 in the morning or whatever the fuck hours he's on. Who knows? The truth is, I don't think Howard Stern really takes ICP that seriously as a music group. He has bands that he personally likes to listen to, like Marilyn Manson and others that he's told me he likes. Unfortunately, just like pretty much the rest of America, he just looks at us as a novelty joke band, perfect for his radio show. Hey, that's okay. He's still cool as fuck for having us on the show three times a year anyway. Well, back to the earlier subject. 
On one sweaty August morning, Howard decided he'd get us in Cold Chamber to square off live on his show. He always liked to have Joey and I battle somebody on the show, just like when we battled with that one guy called the Angry Black Guy, which is a set-up plant in case you saw the show, because once we were off the air, we bolted downstairs to find him and beat his ass, only to find a security guard who explained to us that the Angry Black Guy is actually a regular on the show, and he works for Howard. Hmm... Howard loves to get us worked up on the air. He tried to get us to battle Slipknot once, too. That didn't work because they, at the time, were actually fans of ours. Well, this time, he had these two pansy-ass guys from Cold Chamber with the blush and eyeliner and the fishnet G-strings come on the show and ask us why we threw them off the tour face to face. And I had to tell them right to their face. Painted faces. Not clown juggalo style. I'm talking eyeliner, mascara, and blush. Well... We told everybody it was just about equipment problems, but if you want the truth on national radio, we'll give it to you. Your lame-ass band straight up didn't sell any fucking tickets. Nobody will tell you that because everybody's afraid of your crumpet-ass bitch manager, so they'll never throw you off their tours. But us, we don't give a fuck about you or that bitch-ass manager of yours. You got thrown off our tour because y'all ain't worth no fucking tickets, bitch. They felt stupid as fuck. They climbed into each other's panties and left. After we left the show that day, we went back to bed at our hotel. Cold Chamber's bitch-ass big shot manager, Sharon Osborne, who now is super famous thanks to the Osborne's TV show, called Howard Stern up. She wanted to see if we'd say all that mean shit about her to her face. Within hours, the folks at Howard Stern called us up and booked us again for the very next day to have a verbal war with Sharon Osborne face to crumpet face. You're all washed up. You're through, she kept saying with her little tea and crumpet lady voice. Your career is in the toilet. She made fun of the fact that the amazing Jekyll Brothers had sold only 400,000 copies. But for us, that's amazing. But we were like, yeah, bitch, that was with no radio or video play. That was all on our own, bitch. We're not hot this summer, then gone the next. We'll stay on that chart. We'll be selling when Cold Chamber is out on the street selling nipple rings on the corner. By the way, now that they're broken up, that's probably exactly what they're doing. While the amazing Jekyll Brothers has now reached over an almost double platinum status. Well, your tour is only filling about half the seats in the venues you're playing. She kept shooting back at us, whatever she could. Damn right, the amazing Juggle Brothers showed us we weren't an arena band. She got that right. We were still drawing three and four thousand Juggalos a night, but it was in these huge ten thousand person arenas. Even so, we were fucking happy as hell with them 3,000 ninjas a night. Then Sharon told us she was suing us for kicking Cold Chamber off the tour. We had an out-of-court tactic lined up. I'll tell you what, Sharon. You come over here and buff my pickle, and we can forget about all of this right now. That didn't go over so good. She got pissed, and she threw her glasses at me. You're a retard with a two-inch dick, she yelled. People's wigs were blown back that we were telling Sharon Osborne to fuck off. Oh, you don't want to cross her. What the fuck was she going to do to us? Not get our video played? It already ain't getting played. She was such a hated, ruthless bitch in the industry. Everywhere we went after that, bands from everywhere told us how great it was that somebody finally told that bitch to go fuck herself. It was funny and all on that show, but I swear if she would have came any closer, I would have laid that bitch smooth out. 
Everybody remembers the infamous battle versus Sharon Osbourne on the Howard Stern Show. We went back and forth saying the most ruthless shit we could possibly think of, tearing her to shreds. Then she would attempt to tear us to shreds, and we were going for each other's throats, and we had no mercy because she couldn't do a damn thing to us in the industry. Because once again, we're in the streets, bitch. Why don't you come step over the line into our world, and let's see what's really going on and we're happy we're elated and we're proud that we kicked cold chamber the fuck off our tour back then in fact that was one of the smoothest moves we've ever made in our career because of that move we ended up on the Howard Stern Show in one of the most infamous battles ever of our career versus Sharon Osbourne's loud, bitchy ass. And we infamously told her to eat a dick up until she hiccup. And we made a fool out of that powerful bitch. One for the underdogs. Yeah. yeah. And if you remember correctly, on the air, in front of Howard, in front of Robin, and in front of the world, Sharon Osborne bet us that we were here today, gone tomorrow, and that our next album wouldn't even sell 50,000 copies. Well, we took that bet, and when our next album came out, it has since sold 10 times 50,000 copies. It has sold a half a million copies. So, Sharon, you owe us the dough. And here's what you need to do. Pick a charity. Any charity. Just make sure when you donate the money, you tell them it's coming from the job.